Thank you for inviting me. Uh, from time to time, I will stand up because this is a very exciting uh, topic. Um, for several years, I've been working on my PhD dissertation on the subjects of Frankish burial customs in the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. The research questions that I posed dealt with the social status of the deceased, their gender, chronological differences between the burial of the 12th century and the 13th centuries, the differences between burial in the Crusader cities and the burial in the rural settlements, questions of origin, and possible sources of influence on burial customs. In Europe and medieval Byzantium, thousands of burial sites ranging from individual graves to large cemeteries have been excavated and documented. Here in the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, while we are quite familiar with the Frankish cemeteries of Caesarea, Athlete, and Tiberias, the overall archaeological record is fragmentary and poor. In funerary archaeology, the volume and the quality, as you saw, of the documentation and the publishing of the finds are crucial to the understanding of the burial customs. In the case of the Frankish burials, the scarcity of the finds and the insufficient documentation make it difficult to deal with the primary questions that I posed in my research. In the present lecture, I will demonstrate what I mean by shortage of finds and poor documentation, and I will try to define the reason for this. In the second half of the lecture, I will talk about further aspects of Frankish funerary archaeology that present methodological difficulties. We are all familiar with the 13th century map of Ekra by Matthew Paris. This map clearly shows the urban cemetery of St. Nicholas, here marked with red arrow, and give its size as nearly identical to the size of the Montmizal quarter. I tried to situate this cemetery on a modern map of Ekra. The lower red circle that you see here is the location suggestion made by Kedar and Pringer while the upper red circle is my own suggestion. In modern times, both areas have been extensively developed and built, but not a single bone or a tombstone from this cemetery has been recovered, even though, according to the historical sources, thousands of people were buried there. Let's move to Jerusalem. Less than half a kilometer to the west of Jaffa Gate, we have the Mamila Cemetery, which today is a Muslim cemetery. A few tombstones in this, in this cemetery are in secondary use and originally belong to Crusader tombs. In addition, a late... This is what happened when you are excited. <laughs> a late mausoleum, known by the name Tubet Kubakia, may originally have been constructed by the Crusaders. In the Crusader times, the Mamila Cemetery was a large and well-known burial ground outside the city walls, which mainly served the canons from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Between 2005 and 2014, extensive archaeological excavations were conducted in the cemetery, spanning some 10 dunams in area, marked with a blue line here. Thousands of later Muslim graves were uncovered. But the Crusader Cemetery still eludes us. We are now in Jaffa, a major port city in the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. On the left is a modern map of Jaffa on which the archaeological tale and the boundaries of the medieval city are indicated. The little numbers indicate archaeological excavations carried out by the Israeli Antiquity Authority in recent years. I personally participated in many of these salvage excavations. Jaffa has been dug extensively with hardly a stone left unturned. <laughs> However, despite the common assumption that the urban Crusader Cemetery was located in the northern part of the city, it has never been found. The only find that might possibly relate to it is the discovery of four simple cyst graves uncovered in the area of the Kishle by the Israel Institute of Archaeology. The question of the location of these urban cemeteries, which despite their large size are still elusive, becomes even more enigmatic when we consider the contemporary historical sources. 
In Crusader times, our region witnessed numerous violent events with epic battles and dev devastating plagues exacting their toll. During the 1191 siege of Ekra, there was an outbreak of a violent plague. A source describing the voyage of Emperor Barbarossa mentions that the number of the victims was so great that it seemed as if the human race was coming to an end. In the Battle of 4B, in October 1244, the Crusader army, numbering 50,000 knights, infantry, and allies, battled against what was roughly an equal number of Muslim warriors. While contemporary Crusader accounts do not mention the exact number of the Crusader casualties, the Arab sources claim an almost complete annihilation of the Crusader army. Where are the mass graves of the Crusaders? Where is the final resting place of the thousands of victims of battles and plagues? The only mass grave with which we are familiar was excavated in Sidon by the British Museum in collaboration with the Lebanese Department of Antiquities. This mass grave has recently been in use following new research into the DNA of the victims. It contained over 60 individuals who were probably killed during violent Muslim raid on the city in 1253. Why is it so hard to find these cemeteries? Why are they are so elusive? It cannot be that all of them just disappeared fading in time. While the answer to these questions may turn out to be trivial and obvious, still, they still need to be discussed and defined. First, there is of course the possibility that we have been looking in the wrong places. Take, for example, the Mamila Cemetery. The northern part was extensively excavated, but the southern part was never touched. Perhaps the Crusader Cemetery lies there? Excavations cannot take place. No, no, no. Second, these large cemeteries may lie under holy places, Muslim or Christians, where excavations cannot take place. For example, the warriors who fell in the Crusader battle of Jerusalem in 1099 were buried at the foot of the Gate of Mercy in Jerusalem, which since medieval times have been an active Muslim cemetery, so you cannot excavate there. This is also the case in the Mamila Cemetery, the St. Nicholas Urban Cemetery of Ekra, according to Pringle and Ketan's proposal, is located under Muslim and Greek Orthodox cemeteries. Furthermore, burial inside churches or within churchyards is a well-known phenomenon in medieval times. Many of the large and important churches from the Crusader times continue to serve as holy places, churches or converted into mosques even to this day. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem, the Church of Annunciation in Nazareth, the Church of St. John in Gaza, which became a mosque, are a few examples. Excavating within these holy places is all but impossible. In the few cases which we managed to carry out limited excavations within these important churches, we found beneath the pavement, the pavement, paving, or within the churchyard, numerous graves. So the potential is there. For example, in 1996, I excavated in the chapel of the 40 martyrs in the Holy Sepulchre. All I did was just opening an archaeological pit of one by one and a half meters, and I came across numerous graves. In the church of Annunciation in Nazareth, the Italian archaeologist Bellarmino Bagatti excavated the area outside the church next to the main apsis and found dozens of church at burials. In Bagatti's excavation of the Crusader Cloister of the Nativity Church in Bethlehem, he exposed several cyst graves. A fourth reason for our inability to uncover Frankish cemeteries and graves is the deliberate destruction of burial sites that have taken place both in ancient and modern times. Let's take the case of Mamila, for example. In 1927, the Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al Husseini, built a luxurious hotel over part of the Mamila Cemetery. During the digging, uh, during the digging that took place in order to lay the hotel's foundations, 
graves and skeletons came to light. The Mufti gave the order to keep the discovery in secret. We cannot rule out the possibility that what was, that what was destroyed in the course of the establishment of the hotel was part of the Crusader Cemetery. The deliberately destruction of the Frankish graves started in medieval times. Just take a look at these small pieces of tombstones. I believe that it's clear that they were deliberately shattered. You can just imagine people standing over the tombs with hammers and smashing the tombstones. This is not surprising because the Muslims following their conquest tried to erase any memory of the Crusaders, graves and tombstones are a powerful symbol of their presence. Indeed, there is a literary evidence for such destruction. The 13th century Muslim historian and scholar Abu Shama described the, the destruction and the erasing of the rich crusader tombs under the gate of mercy. Tombs that, according to him, belong to the crusader who sat in the Dome of the Rock. According to the manuscript of Rotulin, the patriarch Robert informed the West that in August, 1244, the savage Khwarezmians stormed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, beheaded the priest, destroyed the tombs of the Crusader kings, and scattered the bones all over. This description is probably inaccurate and could be a rhetoric of historian who was moved greatly by the events. According to the Annale de Terracent in 1263, the Mamluk Emir Badr Adin besieged Ekra taking up positions on the mound and destroying the towers, the gardens, and the St. Nicholas Cemetery. Surprisingly, the destruction of the Frankish tombs was also carried out by the Crusaders themselves. Archaeological evidence in Caesarea indicates that in the 13th century, the churchyard graves were deliberately destroyed when the fortification was built and expansion works carried out. The custom of destroying and reopening tombs is well known in medieval West, and it's probably connected to political statements, act of revenge, and issues of density in the graveyards. Ludolf of Sudan, after seeing the tombs of the Crusader kings in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in 1336, says, I wonder how the heretics spared these tombs and left them intact, lying in all their glory. They, the Muslims, took the country from the Christians, while in Lombardy, in Italy, the Christians themselves removed bodies from the graves and throw them to the dogs. The scarcity of the find is not only due to the actions of the people of antiquity. The political and cultural reality in Israel today all but prevent excavation in ancient tombs. In this sense, the excavation at the Tlid is exception. Ultra-Orthodox Jewish circles oppose, for religious reasons, the excavation of tombs, so to the point of even rioting at excavation sites and physically blocking the excavations. Let me give you an example from a current excavation. To the west of the old city of Jerusalem, a pit was uncovered, full of skeletons, including women, children, and infants. Most of them found decapitated. The pit dated to the second century BC, not Crusader. The dramatic discovery was quickly excavated under supervision of the ultra-Orthodox, and the bones were immediately taken for reburial with hardly any examination. While I'm not taking sides in this debate, I'm simply presenting the dilemma. Perhaps it would be better to let the dead rest in peace. As I have said, another reason for the lack of information regarding Frankish burials is the improper archaeological documentation and only partial publishing of the finds. The first to dig Frankish tombs in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries were antiquarians and early archaeologists who sometimes have little expertise. Here you can see Professor Leon Arie Meyer of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the rector of the university between, between 1943-45. He is examining the tomb of Philippe de Orvani in the Holy Sepulchre. Meyer was an orientalist 
and a scholar of Islamic history. His report regarding this important tomb is no more than one and a half lines in an obscure letter. Another example for the dynamics of early researchers and the incomplete information they provide come from the church and the church at burials of the Crusader village of Kubebe, north of Jerusalem. In 1861, Paulina de Marquis of Nicolay excavated the church, finding tombstones and graves. Between the year 1873-75, a military uh, captain by the name Gulimot excavated there, finding three graves. The priest, Frere, Frere Stanislaus de Alla, conducted an excavation on the site between 1887 and 1819 and found graves east to the church. Between 1900 and 1902, prior to the renova renovation of the church, an extensive archaeological excavation was conducted along the building foundation by the Franciscan monks who uncovered graves. Finally, in 1940s, during World War II, Dr. Francis Canova, head of the Italian hospital in Kerak, Syria, was arrested and imprisoned in Kubebe. He spent his days digging a large and important tomb within the church and writing about it in his diary. So, you can see from all of this that the excavations of tombs were carried out by amateurs rather than professionals. If you are under the impression that the situation today with modern researchers is any different, well, I'm not so sure. Generally speaking, exploring Frankish burials is not the primary goal of the archaeologists today. They tend to bump into them while excavating with the goal of reaching earlier strata. Their excavation budget usually is not intended for the excavation of these burials. This leads to a chain of events which is less than beneficial to the Frankish burials. In this situation, the excavation is usually quick with, without the particip participation of necessary expert. The documentation is incomplete. The finds are sometimes left unpublished or, all, or only partially published frequently with sweeping generalization. <laughs> generalization. <laughs> I'm eight generation here in Israel, so excusing for my English and without relating to the individual tombs and the wide variety of topics relating to the funerary archaeology. Here in Caesarea, many archaeological expeditions of well-qualified archaeologists search for the Roman temple, the octagonal Byzantine church, and the Herodian city, and were surprised to discover the burial in the churchyard of the Crusader Cathedral and the urban cemetery. Some of these graves contained important finds, such as pieces of armor, a peculiar burial customs of covering the skull. These did not receive the attention they deserved. The bones uncovered in one of the excavation areas in Caesarea Urban Cemetery were summarized in a page and a half, containing only the age, gender of the disease, but with no details about the pathology, traumas, burial position, or anything else. The only exception were the pieces of cloth, probably remnants of luxurious garments, that were found in a grave inside the cathedral, which were subject of in-depth study carried, I, carried out by Richard Mir of the Israeli Antiquity Authority. This is the only graphical documentation ever to have been published from the Caesarea churchyard burial, a picture, a schematic plan, and a location map. Can we learn anything from this? Where is the documentation of each individual grave? Where is the discussion of the burial position? We have no photographs, no osteological information. What about the grave goods and their relation to the skeletons? Nothing. We will continue to demonstrate using Caesarea as a case study how the documentation and the finds were lost over time. My own attempt to locate the material from the churchyard of burial in, in Caesarea were unsuccessful. The lead excavator had passed away. I was sent from one excavator to another, from one storage facility to another. Ultimately, however, nobody could tell me where the material is and if it even exists. This scenario repeated itself time after time. I managed to locate Analamim, 
who was the, the surveyor of the Caesarea excavations, and she drew up a plan of the churchyard cemetery with the location of the graves, but nothing more. Another example of material that was lost was the, was the city cemetery of Tiberias, excavated by Bezalel Rabani in 1952. He excavated 88 graves. The only documentation that we have from the excavation is a faded plain, few photographs, and a number of sentences in his private diary. Robert studied the coins, but where are the bones? Where are the other finds? Nobody knows. In some cases, the situation is not so bad. Sometimes the material exists, but has never been published. Professor Joseph Patrick of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem is a meticulous and dedicated scholar. He excavated part of the urban cemetery of Caesarea. The material is all there, but not published. Professor Patrick has very generously made the data available to me. All this should not be understood as criticism or an accusation, accusations against my predecessor. Most of them did whatever they could within the time limitations, concentrate budget, and the meager facilities at their command. I am sure that our work too will be examined with skeptical eyes by, the, by our successor in light of the technology and knowledge that we cannot even imagine today. Finally, I would like to raise two more methodological aspects that in my opinion are unique to the research of the Frankish burials in our region. The areas excavated are usually located within mounds and multi-layer sites which contain additional burials both earlier and later than the Crusader period. The important Crusader churches are generally built over early Byzantine churches which, which also contain burials. How are we to distinguish between these graves? In the absence of datable finds, material pointing to the identity of the disease and funerary inscriptions, it is difficult to distinguish between the Frankish and Byzantine burials. More than once, this has led to confusion and uncertainty in dating the graves. In Yokneam, the Frankish Caimont, the church is built over remains of a Byzantine church. No. The, uh, the church is built over remains of Byzantine church, Yokneam. Five systems and pit graves were uncovered in the area, the ent in, in the area entrance leading to the church. They contained eight individuals, including six adults and two children. The bodies are supine, with the head facing west and the legs to the east. The hands were placed along the sides of the body or folded over the pelvis. No burial goods or other datable finds were uncovered. According to the excavators, the graves create chronological problem. Are they crusader? Are they Byzantine? We do not know. The churches in Bethany and Emmaus were built above the remains of Byzantine churches. Salar includes the graves found in the portico of Bethany church in his discussion of the Byzantine church. Pringle considered them to be crusader burials. The graves in the church at Emmaus were installed into the stilobat and the northern wall of the Byzantine church. In addition, these tombs at Emmaus penetrated and cut into a Byzantine mosaic and were sealed by a crusader floor. Thus, they are later than the Byzantine period and either earlier or contemporary with the crusader period. Nevertheless, in the absence of datable and identifying finds, Vincent and Abel considered them to be Byzantine in date, while Pringle believed they were medieval. The same problem exists in the large cemeteries that were turned into Muslim cemeteries. A few individuals have been found lying in Christian burial position in the excavations of the Kishna in Jaffa and the Mamila in Jerusalem within a multitude of Muslim burials. Are these Frankish burials? Should the Christian burial position be considered a clear indicator of Frankish burial in such cases? 
or perhaps these are Muslim barriers that deviate slightly from the Muslim norm. When we reflect on the burial customs of the Frankish East, three basic sources of influences must be considered. The West, local Christian population, and non-Christian local population, primary Muslim but having further smaller groups as Jewish and others. This said, each of these three factors bring its own complexities. Frankish settlers who came from the West were highly heterogeneous group ethnically, culturally, and socially. It had French, Germans, Italian, Normans, noble traders, clergymen, knights, peasants, common people, richer and poorer individual, educated and uneducated. This diversity must have played a role in the burial practices, reflecting regional traditions, popular belief, and folklore. At the same time, these people were also subject to the overarching of the Catholic Christian doctrine, which has already codified certain practices. The Frankish Kingdom of Jerusalem should be paradise for scholars who want to study medieval burial. But first, crucial methodological points must be clarified. Can we identify German grave or Provencal grave? Can we produce a clear classification of temporary or hospitaler burials? Some preliminary ideas exist, but the overall picture remains unclear. The subject of local burial custom deserves a lecture in its own right. We will just say that we are faced with similar methodological problems. Astonishingly, we have no archaeological evidence for Eastern, Christian, or even Muslim grave between the 10th and the 13th century. You're tired? <laughs> One more minute. I would have liked to talk also about the issues of grave goods and burial positions. These are fascinating topics which unfortunately we'll have to wait for another lecture too. In conclusion, I would like to say that despite the methodological difficulties and the lack of clarity our knowledge on the Frankish burial customs is constantly growing. The sensitivity of modern researchers, the growing awareness with the Crusader period in Israel, and the professional teams such as the one led by Ibn Atlit, all bring Frankish funerary archaeology, until recently a marginal subject, to the forefront of the research. Thank you. <laughs>